Wonderful students. This is the chapter on health assessment. This chapter is very important, so please have your book out and take ample notes as you listen to this recording. The nursing assessment and health assessment is performed to gather information on the health status of your patient, the initial head to toe, the health of history, and the physical assessment provide baseline information, and the nursing assessment helps aid in establishing nursing diagnoses as well as interventions um, and as well as evaluating patient care outcomes. Assessments are imperative for us to function in our role as nurses to improve and protect our patient care. Here are the learning objectives for this chapter. Please take a moment to review each one of these. If you can speak to these and apply these to your nursing practice, then you have accomplished your learning for this chapter. A nursing health assessment differs from the medical provider's assessment in that it is a holistic collection of information about factors that affect or are affected by one's level of health. Nurses focus on how a person's health status is affecting activity levels, um, affecting their abilities to perform tasks, as well as how patients are coping with their health issues and or any related loss of function or even their change in ability to do any functions in general. This assessment establishes the foundation for therapeutic care. The initial assessment provides the opportunity to initiate the nurse-patient relationship and beginning establishing that trust and begins the nursing process. The nurse is able to get the general health status of their patient, obtain baseline information to make clinical um, assessments about the patient's strengths as well as their weaknesses while identifying any potential problems or actual problems. <clears throat> the health assessment consists of collecting, validating, and analyzing data. So when we're looking at data, first example, we're looking at subjective data. This is based on the patient's experiences as well as their own perceptions. We also look at objective data, which is our measurable and directly observed nursing assessments and information. The health history, uh, the health assessment, sorry, consists of two main components. First is the health history, which is the collection of the subjective information, which is about the patient's um, health status, their perception of their health status. And then our physical assessment, which is literally the objective data that we are documenting about changes in the patient's body systems. And we're going to definitely look at all eight body systems in this recording. So in our health assessment, again, we're going to look and do a thorough health history, risks for depression. We're going to look at the patient's functional ability, their level of safety. We're going to do physical examination, again, looking at all eight body systems, and we're going to do patient ed education and counseling as well. There are several different types of health assessments. The first one we're going to look at is a comprehensive assessment. This is done upon admission to the healthcare facility. This assessment is intended to gain a broad picture of the patient and includes the health history, the physical assessment, and establishes the patient's baseline health status and is used to compare future assessments to evaluate patient outcomes. The ongoing assessments are conducted throughout the patient's stay at regular intervals. For example, every nurse at the start of their shift will do a full head to toe assessment. Um, and then we also, you know, we do that so that we can monitor and identify as early as we can any kind of positive changes in our patient, any kind of areas of concern or negative changes in our patient, right, since we got report. A focus assessment is done to assess a specific problem. We do focus assessments on the unit when a patient comes up from the floor from surgery. The first assessment is done to establish the patient's condition post-op. Remember, you know, when anybody goes post-op, there's always a risk for certain complications post-op, like bleeding or hypovolemia or potentially, you know, um, neurostatuses from the anesthetics or pain medications that they get right in surgery or in the PACU, those kinds of things, right? Um, so when a patient comes up post-op, we're going to be doing, looking at, you know, doing specifically an abdominal, let's say the patient came up, for example, from an abdominal surgery, we're going to do an assessment of the area, look for, and we're going to be looking for what's called shadowing. This is the wound secretions that 
soak through the dressing itself, right? So if we see some shadowing occur, there we do expect some bleeding, right? But it shouldn't be significant bleeding. We'll come back through again and reevaluate uh, to make sure again that it's not excessive bleeding. <clears throat> Excuse me. Another example of a focus assessment is when you walk into a patient's room and they are complaining of having shortness of breath. The nurse would assess the oxygen saturation levels, listen to the lungs. Um, when doing the focus assessment, you're focusing on the area that the patient is having a specific problem with or potential problem with, right? Okay. An emergency assessment is a rapid focused assessment addressing a life-threatening or unstable condition or situation, right? So for example, if a patient comes into the emergency room and they got stung in the face by a bee and their airway is closing because they're having an anaphylaxis type one hypersensitivity reaction to that bee sting, right? And we're of course gonna be most concerned with ABC airway breathing circulation, right, first. So, um, we're going to address that issue first, and then we'll address anything else that's going on with the patient, right? Um, again, if your patient comes up from surgery and is bleeding all over the bed, you're more concerned about what's, you know, where's the source of the bleeding, and then once you find it, applying pressure and stopping the bleeding, and less concerned about their drowsiness or even shallow breathing from pain, pain medications they got in the PACU, right? Um, this actually happened to a patient um, on our floor. The patient had abdominal surgery and the surgeon placed a wound vac system, um, you know, over the incision site. However, the wound vac system couldn't keep up with the amount of bleeding that was occurring with the patient. And the patient's wife called um, the educator's peer nurse, that was the patient's nurse, into the room and the bed was soaked with the patient's blood. So the nurse came for the patient, applied pressure to the wound while um, the other nurse called the surgeon and the patient went immediately back into surgery. So that's why we watch our patients really closely, um, especially if they're coming up post-op, right? Okay, some considerations when performing health assessments, obviously lifespan considerations. We're gonna look at the patient and based on where they're at in the lifespan, there should be certain thresholds met or certain things that uh, where they should be, right? So we're gonna look at that. We're gonna definitely look at cultural and spiritual considerations and sensitivity obviously preparing our patient a hundred percent for whatever you know procedure or or surgery or treatment plan whatever that looks like environmental preparations as well as current and past diagnoses those all come into play uh, preparing the patient for physical assessment so assessment of your patient happens the minute you walk into a room Literally, before you even open your mouth, you're already starting to assess their uh, alertness, right? And then when you start talking to them, you're assessing their neuro status and on, right? So before you try to gain a complete health history or ask the patient about medications they take at home, be sure that they're cognitively you know, uh, cognitively connected enough to be able to answer those questions, right? So for example, if your patient has dementia, then you really can't get a health history from them, right? Because you can't trust the source due to the disease process. So um, also think about timing when you go to do, you know, your physical assessment. If your patient's in pain, does it make sense that you would medicate them first and then come back, right? Because you want to make sure that uh, you have their full attention, right? So medicate them, come back in 20 to 30 minutes um, once the pain medication has had time to take effect, right, to do the physical assessment. And again, the time to do the physical assessment shouldn't uh, interfere with daily routine routines like meals um, or if a patient has a special visitor, we could come back, right? Um, gather the supplies and instruments needed for the assessment. So for example, thermometer, sphygmomanometer, pen lights, stethoscope, all of those things, right? Provide privacy by pulling the curtain or closing the patient's room door. Always tell your patients what you are going to do and get their approval before you actually touch them. Um, I always like to start off with a broad explanation of what a physical assessment is and then when you actually go to do the assessment you're gonna be very specific as to what we're doing right um, 
we have an assessment on the floor that is expected to be done anytime a patient comes to the unit. It's called a four eyes assessment. It is a skin assessment done by two RNs, head to toe, front to back. We look even between the toes and things like that. We're looking for any skin issues so that we can document them and the physician and or wound nurse can address these issues. I have had patients refuse this assessment and at my facility they have the right to refuse. Um, so we have to respect the patient's decisions. Always be direct and honest with your patients. They are active participants in their own care. So be sure to include them. And it's important, very important, to document their refusal to allow the skin assessments, right? It's important because um, those skin assessments are crucial to ensure that if a patient has an existing wound from their home or from wherever they reside, right, um, that it's documented so that the hospital doesn't try to get charged for the care of that wound or, you know, blame for the wound, letting it happen on our watch per se. Okay, preparing the environment for physical assessment. Before conducting a physical assessment, right, again, the physical assessment is the collection of objective data that provides information about changes in the patient's body systems, all eight body systems, right? You wanna be sure that the patient is comfortable. If there are other individuals in the room, please ask them to step out for the assessment. Explain to the patient to what extent the assessment will be taking. Um, so again, to relax their fears or embarrassments or worried about abnormal findings, like I don't want to fail this test kind of thing, just explain it in general terms and then you can get into greater detail when we actually do the um, eight body systems. If you're taking a health history, which of course remember is a collection of subjective information uh, from the patient that provides, uh, you know, information about the patient's health status, be sure the patient is okay with the individuals in the room while you are asking the personal health history questions before proceeding, right? Be sure to provide privacy, pull the curtain, close the door before uncovering the body. Always be respectful of your patient and when assessing the, bo uh, the body, provide a drape or a gown and keep them covered as much as possible, right? Only expose whatever limb you happen to be evaluating at that time. Watch where you place your hands or how you move your hands, right? We're gonna discuss this more in detail in lab and give techniques while demonstrating a physical assessment. Please see your fundamentals book for more information on documenting a health assessment. The equipment a nurse will have during a physical examination includes a stethoscope to listen with, thermometer and blood pressure cuff to obtain vital signs, a scale to weigh your patient, and a measuring tape for measuring wounds or swelling limbs, a pen light, and a watch with a second hand. For lab, you're going to need your stethoscope, pen light, and a, lot, and a watch with a second hand that doesn't, uh, you know, that stays lit for multiple minutes at a time, right? So it doesn't you don't lose the screen after a couple, like a minute or two. It has to stay on. Uh, positions during your physical assessment. While the patient is standing, you can assess gait and balance. This is a good indication of your patient's mobility. Have them walk for you. If they use a mobile a mobility device, have them show you how they use it to assess proper use of the device itself. If your patient can sit up, it is always best to have them do so when assessing the lung sounds. When auscultating and palpating the abdominal sounds, have your patient lying in the supine position. Considerations when performing health assessments. Information is collected during an interview with your patient and remember, the patient is the primary source of data. The patient's family members, caregivers, friends, etc., may also be an important source of data, especially in the situations where we just explain, you know, if they have dementia or even if the patient's unconscious because they were in an accident, whatever that may be like, right? They can sometimes offer insights that cannot be gained from patients who may be acutely ill, may be in pain, may be cognitively impaired, etc. Nurses need to balance the benefits of obtaining information from family members, friends, caregivers with the potentiality of conflicting motivations of the patient families and caregivers, right? The health records of the patient, if available, can also be used to 
to collect additional information about what's happened with your patient in the past. Nurses should know and be sensitive to cultural differences that influence how both verbal as well as nonverbal communication is um, presented as well as interpreted. So be careful. Many times pa people don't intend to come across the way you're the way we are reading them right it's just a cultural thing so don't uh try not to be so judgmental in those kinds of things right i know it can be hard right but just try um the nurse is in a dependent role during this time as the nurse is following the verbal direction of the um, app so we're looking specifically at nurses roles in diagnostic procedures so again the nurse is in a dependent role during this time because they're getting directions from the advanced practice uh, practitioner, right? APP, advanced practice practitioner. So that literally means a PA, an NP, or a doctor, right? An MD. Um, so we're going to assist before, during, and after diagnostic tests. We're going to complete the testings as described. Our uh, job will be to witness the patient's consent. We've talked about this in pretty detail in class, but remember, when you witch witness the patient's signature on a consent form, um, if they have any questions about the procedure or surgery, you're going to call down the surgeon doing the procedure, right? and have them go over it. Our job is just to witness the signature and make sure the patient doesn't have any questions. Schedule the test, prepare the patient physically and emotionally for the test, provide care and teaching after the test, dispose of any unused equipment and transport any specimens that were collected during the test. Factors to assess during a health history. So much of the biological biographical data may already be in the patient's chart by the time the RN comes in to collect information. However, if it is missing, we need to fill it in. Be sure to identify the patient's primary language as you may need an interpreter from the facility, not a family member, to explain medical procedures or help with the health history. Many patients who are bilingual may need information interpreted in their primary language language to gain comprehension. Be sure to assess this fully as we wouldn't want someone to consent to something they didn't fully understand. It's our job as the nurse. Ask them why they are seeking care to help clarify their needs. Obtaining past medical history along with present history is important to gain a broad picture of your patient's health status. Knowing what prior surgeries the patient had is important. For example, I received report once that my patient had no history of major surgeries. However, when I completed the head-to-toe assessment, I discovered my patient had a colostomy. It happens, so it's always important to ask, okay? Functional health assessment is important. I can't stress this enough. You need to know if your patient has any deficits, such as weakness from a stroke or neuropathy in their extremities, anything that could compare uh, that could impair their mobility or impair their ability to feed themselves. Right? I've had patients on the unit that had uh, that no one knew they couldn't feed themselves for the first full day they were in the hospital. Right? So please don't let this happen. Know your patients as well as their limitations. Okay. Techniques for gathering physical health assessment data are inspection, palpation, and auscultation. Inspection of the patient. So you're going to inspect each area of the body for size, color, shape, position, movement, symmetry, right? So we're going to compare one side with the other. Um, let's see. You are looking for any abnormalities. Palpation uses the sense of touch to gather important assessment data, such as palpation of the pulses, skin temperature, texture, turgor, skin moisture, dryness, shape, all of those things, right? Auscultation, listening with the stethoscope to sounds produced within the body, like lung sounds, heart sounds, abdominal sounds, etc. You will need to be able to describe in detail all of your assessment findings. So you need to start memorizing and committing to permanent memory all of the phrases used when doing assessments, right? Be sure to look at the key terms in this chapter and understand them um, and be able to regurgitate and be able to, to uh, document appropriately, right? Such as erythema, cyanosis, jaundice, all of these things, right? Jaundice. You will be using these terms when describing your findings when you do your physical assessments. 
This is a great diagram of the abdominal quadrants. You will use this when gathering pertin pertinent assessment data about the abdomen and your abdominal um, assessments with your patients. For example, when your patient points through to their abdomen and says it hurts right here and points to the area on their stomach, you are able to make note of this and explain this to your provider. Um, he or she will want to know which quadrant the patient is reporting pain in, right? Could be indicative of several things going on listed on this slide. When documenting administration of medication, for example, you'll want to say which quadrant you did that in. If you're giving a uh, you know, sub-Q insulin or a heparin injection, right? Lovenox, those kinds of things. Um, you will definitely want to document, you know, which quadrant the injection was given in, and you want to always rotate your sites when doing injections. Characteristics of sounds heard when you're auscultating. So when describing sounds auscultated, you will always note pitch, loudness, quality, and duration. All four. Again, when describing sounds, auscultated, you should note pitch, loudness, quality, and duration. So pitches ranging from high to low. Loudness is ranging from soft to loud. Quality, for example, would be gurgling, swishing. And then we have duration, of course, short, medium, or long. Okay. General survey. Okay, the general survey is the first component of the physical assessment, beginning with the first moment of patient contact and continuing through the nurse patient relationship. The general survey contributes to the overall impression of the patient. It includes observing the patient's overall appearance and behavior, taking vital signs, measuring height, weight, waist circumference, calculating the body mass index or BMI, looking at um, your um, ratio of weight to height, right? I want you to uh, pause and take a moment and review the step-by-step -step procedure of this in your skill book. You'll need to be able to perform this as a nurse. Um, please take a look at your fundamentals book too, as there's a really good information on there on uh, a brief general physical assessment. The book describes a brief, um, you know, this brief assessment and the description I really, really like. Um, and then when you walk into the patient's room and how you're going to do that. Listed on this slide are the components of the head to toe physical assessment. It is called a head to toe assessment because that is literally what you're doing and should do it in an organized manner. Um, we are going to start at the top of the person's body and assess from the head front to back, then all the way down to the toes. First, we are going to introduce ourselves, explain to the patient what we are going to do, get their consent approval to do it, and then do it. Then we provide privacy, wash our hands, identify the patient with two identifiers. So we're going to check the patient's armband while looking at the medication administration record. We will be going over this in detail in lab again. Our assessment data comes from touching, listening, and palpating the person's body head to toe. Again, we're going to go into spe specifics on these assessments in the upcoming slides. So after the general survey, you will want to assess your patient's first line of defense against infection. This is the skin or integumentary system. We include the hair and nails in this assessment. Go to, again, go to your skills book and refer to it as I go through this assessment. The skin can tell us a lot about a patient's overall health status, hydration status, and nutritional status. We are going to look for any lesions, skin breakdown, rashes, bug bites, bruises, as well as cleanliness. We should also note any body piercings, tattoos, scars, all of those things. Uh, we're going to place our hands on the skin to check for temperature, color, moisture. The skin should not be hot. It shouldn't be reddened. It shouldn't be, excessive mo it shouldn't be excessively moist either. Clean and dry, right? <clears throat> Presence of these could indicate that the patient is running an elevated temp. Bruising may indicate injury of cardiovascular, hematological, or even liver dysfunctions. Skin turgor is checking the hydration status of your patient. Skin turgor, when gently pinched, should bounce back pretty quickly and not remain tinted after release. Tinting indicates poor hydration. This test is usually performed at the clavicle or on the back of the hand. I have a picture of that on the slide. 
Edema is checked in the lower extremities near the ankles and the sacrum. So if they're walkie-talkie, most edema will be at the lower legs and um, ankles. And if they're bed-bound, it'll be in the sacrum, right? Bed-bound or chair-bound. We are looking at the nail's texture and color and in a, any potential clubbing, which could indicate a problem with oxygenation, right? So clubbing or the fattening at the tips of the fingertips, right? Um, abnormalities here may also indicate some malnutrition when you're looking at the nails, if they're like brittle and the hair too, right? Integumentary assessment terminology, you do need to be able to uh, know all of these terms, describe them, uh, you know, thoroughly. So erythema or redness, where is it located? What is the cause? Ecchymosis or bruising, note the color of the bruises, petechiae or hemorrhagic spots or capillary bleeding. Um, is it on the abdomen, on the legs, right? Could be indicative of thrombocytopenia or many other things going on too. Cyanosis, is it bluish or grayish in color? Do Is it circ? Uh, sarcomoral cyanosis, can't say that today, around the lips, right? Jaundice, do they have a yellow color to the skin, which could be indicative of liver disease or of the liver shedding out? Pallor, are they pale? Diaphoretic, are they cold, clammy, sweaty? Turgor, is it elastic? Does it have instant recoil or does it tent? Edema, is there excess fluid, right? All of these things, right? Um, head, neck, and multiple body system, um, assessment. So this assessment is in your skills book as well. Go there and follow along. Your skill book adds more aspects of assessments of the head and neck, but there, are, but these are the basics we will be teaching you. You will be checking your patient's head and neck to assess multiple body systems. You will be checking for pulse reaction to light and the size and shape of the pupils. You will need to darken the room and use a pen light to check for constriction when light is placed on the pupil. Accommodation is looking for the pupil's reaction to constrict when an object gets closer to the eye. You will check the tongue for color, moisture, swelling, and or any lesions. In the neck region, region, you're going to look for any swelling of the lymph nodes. We're going to show you how to do that. You're also going to look at the jugular vein, making sure that it is not distended. Distension can be a result of cardiac condition you will learn more about later in this block, okay? Thorax, lungs, and breasts. This assessment, again, uh, follow along in your assessment book. Your skill book adds more aspects of the assessment, but these are the basics we will be teaching you. You will be checking your patient's thorax, their lungs, rib cage, cartilage, intercostal muscles. You're first going to inspect the posterior thorax. You're going to examine the skin, the bones, the muscles over the spine, shoulder blades in the back, as well as the symmetry of expansion and or accessory muscles use when they're breathing in and out again we're going to compare the left to the right is it you know when they're when patients breathing is it symmetrical right or is one side having to work harder than the other then we're going to assess what's called the anterior posterior and lateral diameters of the thorax right so remember when we're looking at the anterior to posterior aspect of the chest we're looking to see do they potentially have what COPD, right? Because you end up getting a larger <clears throat> barrel chest many times. Um, let's see here. You're going to check to see if the spinal column is straight. Are the left and right shoulder and hips at the same height? Uh, the color should be consistent with the color of the face. The shape and or contour should have a downward equal, equal slope at the rib cage. The chest should be symmetrical with the transverse diameter greater than the anterior to posterior diameter. That's what I was talking about with that barrel like it shouldn't be a barrel chest as seen in the picture um, in the middle and the bottom right that's a barrel chest um, so again the transverse diameter should be greater than the anterior posterior diameter if the patient's healthy palpate over the spine and as well as the posterior thorax to detect any areas of sensitivity chest expansion during respirations tenderness muscle development masses vibrations which could be indicative of frematis all of those things use the palmar surface of the hands to palpate the posterior thoracic landmarks in a sequential pattern as listed in the figure down on the far left um, you're going to compare again you'll see left to right left to right right 
Um, the, the skin should be warm and dry with symmetrical muscle development and no tenderness, no masses, no vibrations, any abnormal finding. Um, you know, it could be that it's cool or it's excessively dry or it's moist. It's asymmetrical. There are vibrations. There are tendernesses somewhere. There's masses, etc. Move on to palpating the chest thoracic expansion. Place the hands over the posterior chest wall at the T9 or T10 location and ask your patient to take a deep breath. As seen in the picture on the right, Observe the movement of your thumbs and hands. The, the thoracic should be symmetrical on both sides, right? On the left and right, um, as shown in the picture on the top right. Then as the patient breathes slowly and deeply through the mouth, auscultate the lungs across and down the posterior thorax to the base of the lungs in a sequential pattern comparing again left to right. Next, inspect the anterior thorax. Rearrange the patient gown so that you're able to visualize the patient's chest. Inspect the skin, the bones, the muscles, and ensure the symmetry, the symmetry of lung expansion when the patient breathes in and out. And check to see if there's any use of their accessory muscles, right? They shouldn't be using their accessory muscles to breathe. Then as the patient breathes slowly and deeply through the mouth, auscultate the lungs across and down the anterior thorax to the bases of the lungs in a sequential pattern again comparing both the left and right side. Use the palmar surface of the hands to palpate the anterior thoracic landmarks in a sequential pattern as listed in the figure on the left. Normal breath sounds consist of loud high-pitched bronchial breath sounds over the trachea, medium pitched bronchovesicular sounds over the bronchi and soft low pitched vesicular breath sounds over the peripheral lung fields. Breath sounds should be rhythmic and effortless with respirations. Listen for duration, listen for pitch, as well as intensity of sounds. Adventitious breath sounds, which are abnormal added sounds, are not normal and typically result from air moving through moisture or mucus or even narrowed airways. If these sounds are heard, have your patient cough. Check to see the color, consistency, and amount of phlegm and document it. <clears throat> Excuse me. You may need to contact the prescriber to get a sample of the mucus to send to the lab to check for infections, especially if it's dark green or, or dark yellow, um, depending upon what's happening with the patient, right? Data from a health history may elicit a health problem such as dyspnea or chest pain, as well as information about cough, sputum, and possibly sleep, sleep patterns, right? A history of smoking indicates the need to include education on means to stop smoking, and this should be included in their plan of care. Additionally, environmental exposure to certain irritants, for example, maybe secondhand smoke, or maybe they, you know, they paint for a professional painting company as their job and they're exposed to paint fumes all the time, or maybe they are, you know, they work for the state and do the air pollution testing on the car, so they're surrounded by exhaust fumes all day, home builders with asbestos fibers, all of those things, right? Um, they could be exposed to these environmental exposures in the home or workplace, thus increasing their risk for respiratory diseases as well as cancer. Assessing the thorax and lungs. So you're definitely going to look um, look in, and evaluate your patient, look to see if they have a history of trauma or lung surgeries. You're going to ask them questions like, do you use any pillows to prop yourself up when you sleep? That's going to tell you a lot, right? Do you have a coughing? Do you have chest pain? Do you have allergies? Um, do you, are you exposed to chemicals or smoke? Um so you're going to inspect the patient's respiratory effort. Is it easy and unlabored? You're going to auscultate and, and document that. And then you're going to obviously look posteriorly at the thoracic and, um, you know, the chest expansion and excursion if that's occurring. Thoracic lungs and breasts. So we're going to inspect the breasts. We're going to... Um, 
have the patient rest their hands at the side of their body, then on the hips, um, and then finally above the head. With the patient holding each position, you're going to inspect the breasts for size, shape, symmetry, color, texture, and skin lesions. You're going to inspect the areola and nipples for size and shape, um, and as well as inspect the nipples for discharge, crusting, or even inversion. See the figure on the right. Um, Palpate the axilla with the patient's arms resting um, against the sides of the body. If any nodules are palpable, assess their location, size, shape, consistency, whether they're tender, whether they're mobile, like if they can move underneath, right, or are they attached. You're going to assist the patient to a supine position, place a small pillow or towel under the patient's back, and ask the patient to place a hand on the, on the side uh, being examined under the head if possible, right? Wear gloves um, just in case there's any discharge from the nipple or if, you know, if obviously if there's lesions, you'll want to wear gloves too. Palpate each quadrant of each breast in a systematic method as listed on the slide. Um, we either use a circular or wedge or like a vertical stripe technique. Um, palpate the nipple and areola and gently compress the nipple between the finger a forefinger and thumb to assess if there's any discharge. Lung sounds, bronch, bronchial, tubular, bronchovesicular. So again, you're going to want to know all of the different adventitious or abnormal extra lung sounds, right? So wheezes are high-pitched musical sounds. Bronchi, um, which you'll hear doctors still use and nurses like me who've been around forever, are coarse crackles. They're harsh, rumbling sounds. And they're f typically from congestion and, um, you know, you sh it's good to have the patient cough. Rails, again, are is an old term. Those are the fine crackles. And these, the fine crackles are more like soft bubbling sounds from, you know, fluid in the lungs. That's, that's what it is. And then the purse, so, you know, Typically, for example, a patient may get furosemide uh, to pull that fluid off, you know, pull those fine crackles off or rails, whatever. And maybe put on fluid restrictions too. Okay, common thoracic and lung variations in older adults. So as adults age, right, they do get exposure to chronic conditions, right, as well as acute, but chronic conditions over time. So there might, they're, could be an increased anterior, posterior chest diameter. We are going to talk about that um, pretty heavily in block one, right? And in block two and so forth. We have, we might have an increase in the uh, dorsal spinal curve or kyphosis. We might have decreased thoracic expansion. We might have a use of our accessory mus muscles, um, specifically to exhale, right? Because you get that... Um, lung, you know, the alveoli collapsing at the end of the breath, and so it traps that CO2, right? So we're gonna, that's why we teach purse lip breathing and all these things. So we're going to learn about that when we talk about respiratory. Um, but there are expected decreases in our older adults, you know, organ function and so forth as we age. So we'll talk about those, right? Cardiovascular assessment. This assessment, again, um, please follow along on your assessment sheet or in your book. The physical examination is used to identify signs and symptoms of heart disease and peripheral vascular disease. Adequate lighting is essential so that the RN can see the patient's skin and pulsations. Acquired environment is also necessary so that you can hear and thus get an accurate assessment of the patient's heart sounds. Assisting the patient to a supine position with the head of the, bell, uh, the bed elevated to to 30 to 45 degrees, right? Semi Fowlers. Um, the technique used for cardiovascular assessment are inspection, palpation, and auscultation. Necessary equipment include your sphygmo man manometer, your watch with the second hand, um, and the bell and diaphragm of your stethoscope. Inspecting the extremities for color, temperature, lesions, continuity, venous patterns, and edema. Normally, there are no rashes, no ulcers, no edema, no variscosities or venous patterns in the lower extremities. However, if the patient has peripheral vascular disease due to decreased blood flow and oxygenation issues, the skin of the lower extremities might be pale and cool or even shiny with brown discolorations, could be hairless and shiny. Um, the toenails 
maybe typically thickened. You might have phlebitis or inflammation of the veins um, on the lower extremities. Um, and sometimes these are painful, red, swollen, right? Sometimes at the thigh or calf. We are going to palpate the carotid artery medial to the sternomastoid muscle in the neck between the jaw and the clavicle. Palpate one at a time because if you try to palpate both carotid arteries, then you're going to make your, pass, <laughs> your patient pass out um, because of the reduced blood flow to the brain, right? So be careful. Palpate one at a time. Normal finding includes equal pulses bilaterally with the strength of, strength of plus two. You do need to be able to quantify um, different pulses strength. So make sure you write that stuff down from the book when you're reading through. Abnormal findings might include absent pulses, weak pulses, thready pulses, asymmetrical pulse strength, those kinds of things. You're going to palpate the neck and the precordium. Use the palmar surface with the four fingers held together. Gently palpate the precordium for any pulsations. Um, Palpation proceeds in a systemic manner with assessment of specific cardiac landmarks. For example, in block one, we're going to look at your S1 and S2, so your aortic um, and your um, apex of the heart. Um, Palpate the apical impulse in the mitral area. You're going to notate the size, duration, force, and location in relationship to the midclavicular uh, mid line. Okay, so again, uh, the apex of your heart is the fifth intercostal space midclavicular line, and we um, are going to show you how to do that in lab as well. Um, you're going to auscultate. You're going to listen to hard sounds. Ask the patient to breathe normally. Use the diaphragm of the stethoscope first to listen to high pitch sounds. Then use the bell of the stethoscope and auscultate the low pitch sounds. Focus on the overall rate and rhythm of the heart and the normal heart sounds. Begin at the aortic area, move to the pulmonic area, then to herbs point, then to the tricuspid area, and then finally listen to the mitral area, right? Report and document changes in vascular sounds. Abnormal findings may include extra heart sounds, um, which could be indicative of anemia, heart disease, a number of things, right? Um, it could be an abnormal rate and rhythm, uh, which we could see for serious infections, dehydration, some respiratory disorders. I've had patients in the ICU with head trauma, um, diseases of the heart muscle, etc. It goes long, long, long. Supportive subjective data for this section includes leg pain, chest pain, dyspnea on exertion. All of this information collected during this assessment can also identify activities of daily living and health behaviors that increase the risk of cardiovascular disease, which may include like smoking, lack of exercise, a diet high in calories or a diet high in fats, a diet high in salt. Um, if these risks are identified, then your care plan should include a referral for additional diagnostic testing, as well as additional teaching about modifying diet and health promotion activities, right? Risk factors for alter, altered health include a history of chest pain, palpitations, possibly dizziness, swelling in the ankles or feet, uh, you know, having to prop themselves up on a number of pillows at night to sleep, medications, could be personal or family history of hypertension, diabetes mellitus, high cholesterol, coronary artery disease, history of smoking, you know, how long and how many packs per day are you smoking, um, history of pain in the legs, changes in color or temperature of the extremities, history of blood clots, sores that don't heal, like you can see there are a ton of uh, factors that could be indicative of problems going on, right? Assessing cardiovascular and peripheral vascular systems. So we're going to look at risk factors, history of chest pain, history of palpitations, history of dizziness, history of swelling in the ankles or feet, um, 
medications the patient's taking, personal and or family histories, types and amounts of exercise that they get daily, weekly. Um, we are going to inspect, palpate and auscultate the carotid arteries, the heart sounds, the peripheral pulses, and we're going to do a neurovascular status evaluation, right? Characteristics of sounds heard when auscultating. So again, you have pitch ranging from high to low, loudness ranging from soft to loud, quality, for example, gurgling, swishing, and then duration, of course, short, medium, or long. Top left figure represents the precordium with the traditional cardiac landmarks and areas to auscultate. Top right figure represents the area to palpate over the precordium, with A being the aortic area, B being the pulmonic area, and C being the apical or mitral um, and tricuspid valve area. Bottom left figure represents where the, to palpate the carotid artery. Median, uh, medial to the sternomastoid muscle in the neck between the jaw and the clavicle. Bottom middle figure represents the heart sounds in relation to the cardiac cycle and an electrocardiogram. And bottom right figure is the view of the interior of the heart showing the atrioventricular and semilunar valves responsible for heart sounds. This assessment, again, go along and follow in your book. Assist the patient in the supine position and expose the abdomen. Cover any exposed area other than the one being assessed. First thing you're going to do is inspect the abdomen for skin color, contour, pulsations. Look at the umbilicus. Um, look at the surface uh, for rashes, lesions, masses, scars, tattoos, piercings, etc. Then you're going to auscultate all four quadrants of the abdomen for bowel sounds. So warm the stethoscope and using light pressure, place the flat diaphragm um, of the stethoscope on the right lower quadrant of the patient's abdomen. Then move to the right upper quadrant, the left upper quadrant, and finally the left lower quadrant. Quadrant. You're going to move um, this way because that's how the bowels move, right? So again, right uh, lower, then right upper, then left upper, then left lower. Listen carefully for bowel sounds. So you're listening for those gurgles and clicks and note their frequency and character. Um, you're going to auscultate the, abdomina, uh, the abdomen again for vascular sounds. Use the bell of the stethoscope. Auscultate over the abdominal aorta, the femoral arteries, and the iliac arteries. And you're going to listen for bruise. Palpate the abdomen lightly in all four quadrants. The pads of the fingers are used to palpate with a light, gentle dipping motion, about a half an inch. Watch the patient's face for nonverbal signs of pain during palpation. You're going to palpate each quadrant in a systemic manner, noting any muscular resistance, um, any tenderness, enlargement of the organs, masses. Um, again, you're going to do right lower, right upper, left upper, left lower in that order. Order. You're going to notate if the patient complains of pain or discomfort in any particular area. Um, and then if they do say before you even palpate that they are having tenderness, palpate that area last, okay? Um, so palpate and then auscultate the femoral pulses in the groin. Note the strength of the pulses and grade it as you do with the peripheral pulses. Abdominal assessment. Um, you're going to identify risk factors, right, like abdominal pain, indigestion, nausea and or vomiting, change in bowel habits, their appetite, alcohol ingestion, menstrual history, um, all of those things. And then common abdominal variations in the older adult. Remember, everything slows down as we age. So uh, GI motility, slowing down for digestion, you will have decreased bowel sounds. Remember, because digestion slows down, we're going to have decreased drug absorption, uh, decreased abdominal tone, fat accumulation in the abdomen and hips. Um, that's because of the increase in cortisol levels. Um, we're going to be looking at um, all of these factors. Remember, as we age, we have 
have less sub-Q tissue, right, less fat. So um, that's why the elderly are cold all the time, right, uh, many times because of the loss of heat through the skin, uh, because of the lack of sub-Q tissue, all of these things, right? Um, if there are masses palpated, you're going to note the shape, size, consistency, surface, mobility, and the tenderness. <clears throat> Neurological assessment, again, follow along in your book. Um, assist the patient in the supine position. Begin with surveying of the patient's overall hygiene and physical appearance. Assess the patient's mentation status or their mental status. You're going to evaluate their level of consciousness, evaluate their orientation to person, place, and time. You're going to assess their memory, their immediate memory. You're going to assess their uh, short-term memory, and you're going to assess their long-term memory. Evaluate the patient's ability to understand spoken and written word. Um, you're going to test the patient's cranial nerves. Um, ask the patient to close uh, the eyes. You're going to occlude one nostril and then identify the smell of different substances like coffee, chocolate, alcohol. Repeat with the other nostril. You're going to test the patient's visual acuity and pupillary constriction. You're going to move to the patient's eyes. Um, you're going to do the six cardinal positions of gaze. You're going to ask the patient to smile, frown, wrinkle their forehead, and puff out their cheeks. You're going to ask the patient to protrude their tongue and push against the cheeks with their tongue. You're going to palpate the jaw muscles, ask patient to open and clench their jaws, stroke the patient's face with a cotton ball and ask them if they feel that. You're going to look for the nerve movement as well. You're going to test their hearing with a whispered voice test. You're going to put on gloves, ask the patient to open their mouth. While observing the soft palate, you're going to ask the patient to say, ah, observe upward movement of the soft palate. You're going to test the patient's gag reflex by touching the posterior pharynx with the tongue depressor. Explain to the patient that this may be uncomfortable before you do it. Ask the patient to swallow, and then when you're done with all that, you're going to remove the gloves. Assessing the neurological system. So we're going to look for risk factors like does the patient has a, has a history of numbness, tingling, seizures, trembling, headaches, dizziness, trauma to the head or spine, history of hypertension, history of stroke, do they have any changes in their vision? Changes in hearing, changes in taste or smell. Do they have a history of diabetes or cardiovascular disease or alcohol or medications that could cause changes, right? Um, continuing on with the neurological system, we're going to look at the health history interview, their mental status review, their memory, right? Immediate, short-term, long-term. The emotional status of the patient. Do they have any cognitive um, cognitive uh, gaps, um, behavior, cerebral function, motor skills, coordination, balance, cranial nerve function, uh, motor function, sensory function, how are their reflexes? You're going to look at all of that, right? Musculoskeletal assessment. Again, please go in your book and follow along. Assist the patient in the supine position. Peripheral vascular assessment includes measuring the BP and assessing the skin and perfusion of the extremities and the peripheral pulses. So we're going to, again, inspect, uh, assess the skin and the perfusion of the extremities. We're going to palpate those peripheral pulses using the pads of the index and middle fingers to to palpate peripheral pulses and we're going to fill for amplitude as well as symmetry um, we're carefully going to palpate the following pulses one at a time carotid brachial radial femoral popliteal dorsalis pedis, as well as posterior tibial pulses. Um, and then we're going to check and make sure the cap refill is less than three seconds. Um, identifying risk factors. Have, has there been any trauma? Is there arthritis, neurological disorders, a history of pain or history of swelling of the muscles or joints? Um, do they exercise? What's the frequency and type of exercise? Well, um, do they take any supplements of calcium in their diet? You know, what's their diet like? Do they smoke? Do they exercise? What's their diet history? All of these things, right? Um, history of trauma could, you know, risk factors for altered health history, right? Stuff like history of trauma, arthritis, neurological status, um, all of these things. I think that's the same. Let me see. 
my apologies. Oh, uh, do they have a history of pain or swelling in the joints? Do they um, have any surgeries? Have they had any surgeries on their muscles or joints? Do they have a history of smoking? How long has it been? How many packs per day? If they've been drinking, how long has it been? How much do they drink per day, right? You could see where the amount that you drink or smoke could um, get progressively worth, worse with more, right? Um, you're going to examine the lower extremities. You're going to inspect the legs and the feet for color, lesions, variscosities, hair growth, nail growth, uh, edema, muscle masses. You're going to assess for pitting edema in the lower extremities by pressing um, a finger into the skin, right? Um, and at the pretibial area and dorsum of the foot. If the, you know, if it remains in the skin after the fingers have been removed, pitting it, Pitting edema is present. You're going to palpate for pulses and skin temperature at the posterior tibial dorsalis pedis and popliteal areas. So again, you're going to palpate for pulses and skin temperature at the posterior tibial dorsalis pedis and popliteal areas. You're going to assess the pulse rate, the quality, and the amplitude and rhythm. And you're going to test for cap refill, make sure it's less than three seconds. Ask the patient to move one leg laterally with the knee straight to test abduction, ABD, abduction of the hip. Keep knee straight, move leg medially to test adduction, ADD, duction of the hip. You're going to repeat with the other leg. Ask the patient to raise the thigh against the resistance of your hand. Next, have the patient pushed outward against the resistance of your hand. Then have the patient pull backward against the resistance of your hand. Repeat on the other side. Ask the patient to dorsiflex and then plantar flex both feet against opposing resistance. Ask the patient to do a standing position. Observe the patient as he or she walks with a regular gait on the toes, on the heels, or is it on the heel then the toe like how do they walk you're going to perform the Romberg test ask the patient to stand straight with their feet together both eyes closed with arms at their side wait 20 seconds and observe for patients swaying and their ability to maintain their balance be alert to prevent patients uh, from falling or any kind of injury right uh, because they may lose their balance right and then assist the patient to a comfortable position Common thoracic and lung variations in older adults. The chest should be symmetric with the transverse diameter greater than the anterior posterior diameter. In an, um, in, if there is an increased anterior posterior diameter, this is typically seen with chronic lung diseases. We describe this as a barrel chest, okay? Abnormal findings include the following. An increase in chest size, an increase in chest contour, abnormal breathing patterns with the use of accessory muscles, for example. Symptoms of respiratory disease, such as chronic ob uh, obstructive pulmonary disease, um, or it could be asthma. Unequal chest expansion may occur in like chest trauma or even pneumonia. Abnormal respirations. <clears throat> However, the respiratory system undergoes various anatomical, physiological, and immunological changes with age. The structures change, um, the structural changes include the chest wall and thoracic spine deformities, which impair the total respiratory system, um, you know, being compliant, leading to increased work of breathing for our patients, right? Respiratory muscles, um, their strength decreases with age and can impair a patient's ability to effectively cough, which of course is important for airway clearance, right? I encourage you to look online. There are some great resources for listening to adventitious lung sounds to gain a better understanding what to look for when you're listening for abnormal lung sounds. Um, also look at your fun fundamental book as there are some great adventitious breath sounds and explanation of breath sounds in there. And remember, you have Stedman's um, in your Living Caught resources as well. Common cardiovascular and peripheral vascular variations in the older adult. 
important changes occur with the systems uh, with advanced aging um, and can be even apparent in healthy individuals. So we have over time thickening and stiffening of the large arteries um, that they, they develop due to collagen and calcium deposits as well as loss of elastic fibers, right? And these arterial changes cause your systolic blood pressure to rise with age while diastolic blood pressure uh, generally declines after about the age of 60. In the left ventricle, modest concentric wall thickening occurs due to cellular hypertrophy, right? Um, but the cavity size doesn't necessarily change, right? Doesn't change. Older adults experience thinning in the lining of the stomach. A decrease in the elasticity and uh, fats are therefore not tolerated well. Additionally, a condition that causes a de decrease in the production of digestive juices. So remember from A&P, you have your pepsin, hydrochloric acid, uh, HCL, your pancreatic enzymes, all those things, right? which we call atrophic gastritis. Um, we see this atrophic gastritis. It's very common in the elderly, right? Um, let's see, what else do I wanna tell you? The large intestines also atrophy with age. Um, the elderly are predisposed to constipation due to decreased motility of the colon, as well as dulled sensation for defecation. So we want to ensure adequate fluids, a high fiber diet. We want to make sure they're moving around, you know, physical activity. Um, and then when they get start to begin to get constipated, we want to use laxatives and or enemas as necessary to keep the bowels moving, right? Um, but as we discussed in class, they can't be taking laxatives and enemas daily, right? It's not good. Bowel sounds may be decreased along with a decrease in the abdominal tone, as well as fat accumulation in the um, abdomen, as well as the hips. This slide describes some items discovered through health history that could be related to an alteration or cause an alteration to the patient's health, right? It's an example of what we are analyzing once we complete the comprehensive health assessment. Health history screening tests can identify health problems and diseases early when they um, are much easier to treat, right? So the earlier we diagnose problems, the better off we are and the better off the patient is. Um, Assessment of cognition is done with these questions. If a patient is able to answer all of these, uh, these three questions correctly, refer to that patient as alert and oriented times three. If they answer two of these questions, they are A and O times two, one, um, we say alert and oriented uh, times one. If they cannot answer any of these questions, but they know their name and date of birth, <coughs> then they're alert and oriented to self only. Documentation is so important. If you don't document it, it did not happen. Your assessment is so important to be documented and in a timely manner. Remember, every different team member, including physicians, hospitalists, pharmacy, everyone, right? Other nurses, PTOT, RT, you name it, are using the up-to-date medical record to order other tests or to um, update their plan of care, right? So we need to have it be very timely. Believe it or not, prescribers look at your assessment documentation. Um, many of our physicians have access to patient charts remotely and will look at the nurse's documentation about their new patient, right? How is my new patient doing today? If something is abnormal, they may call you to inquire about it, so don't be surprised. Therefore, it's important to ensure that your assessment and documentation is thorough and accurate and timely documented. Um, assess before your patient goes to a diagnostic test and also when they return to you. Some tests involve giving your patient dyes that are ingested or injected. Always check on them when they return for these, from these tests. It's important to explain a diagnostic test to the patient as they may have some anxiety about it. We as nurses get the consents for these tests um, and 
you will need to have prior knowledge of what the test consists of. The best example I have is like an MRI. We have a screening consent form we get for every MRI ordered. It's our responsibility as the RN to do the screening and to get the consent sign and sent to the MRI department. Um, <laughs> I think that's all I have for this. So this is the end of health assessment.